Hi, my name is Diana Lamb. I am a breast radiologist at the University of Washington, and I will be covering the basics of breast MRI in two lectures. We are first going to review indications for obtaining a breast MRI, followed by MRI technique, and then briefly go over one algorithm for interpreting these exams. In the second portion, we will review the different types of findings with an emphasis on the American College of Radiology Byrad's lexicon for MRI. Finally, we will go over some findings and cases that we commonly see in practice. Breast MRI is the most sensitive tool for detection of breast cancer, as it can identify otherwise occult cancer in both screening and diagnostic settings. As such, one of the major indications is breast cancer screening in the high-risk setting. What qualifies as high-risk, according to the American Cancer Society, is listed here, and it includes a lifetime risk of breast cancer greater than 20 to 25 percent, the patient having a known BRCA mutation, or has a known first-degree relative who has the mutation, but the patient themselves is untested. In addition to these genetic syndromes, women who have had chest radiation, such as for Hodgkin's lymphoma at a young age, are also in this high-risk group. In the setting of a new cancer diagnosis, breast MRI is superior to mammography for identifying and demonstrating the extent of disease. It can be used to screen the contralateral breast and can be used to follow up response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. This is an example of a 51-year-old woman with screen-detected group of calcifications measuring 13 millimeters on mammography. This showed ductal carcinoma in situ, or DCIS, on stereotactic biopsy. Subsequent MRI for extensive disease workup demonstrated multiple speculated masses surrounding the area of biopsy, which would increase the potential extent of disease to at least 40 millimeters. An additional biopsy of one of these masses showed invasive ductal carcinoma. Therefore, the patient had much larger extent of disease than an, on initial mammographic span. In addition, there is a change from ductal carcinoma in situ to an invasive cancer diagnosis up front, which significantly changed her management plan. In women with metastatic breast axillary disease with negative mammographic findings, Breast MRI can identify the primary cancer if it was a breast cancer in about two-thirds of the cases, such as in this case where the patient had a privacy-proven metastatic ax disease to an axillary lymph node on her left side. Her mammogram was negative, and her MRI showed this mass in the anterior breast, which was her primary breast cancer. There are also special clinical scenarios, such as suspicious nipple discharge with normal findings on diagnostic mammography and ultrasound, where a breast MRI can be used for problem solving. This is a subareolar ultrasound in a 46-year-old woman with spontaneous bloody right nipple discharge. Both her ultrasound and her mammogram were negative, so a bilateral breast MRI was performed for further evaluation. On the pre-contrast images on the left, you can see intrinsic T1 signal hyperintensity indicating either blood or proteinaceous fluid within her ducts. On the post-contrast image here, you can see that there is a round mass with circumscribed margins that's enhancing. An MRI biopsy was performed of this mass and pathology revealed an intraductal papilloma, which was the cause of her suspicious nipple discharge. Finally, a breast MRI can be used to evaluate for silicone implant complication, such as intracapsular or extracapsular rupture. Moving on, we are going to talk about basic technical requirements based on the ACR breast MRI accreditation requirements. This includes utilizing a dedicated breast coil and administration of a contrast agent, in this case gadolinium, when looking for breast cancer. Gadolinium is not required to look for silicone implant rupture, and there is no current ACR requirement for a minimum magnet field strength. However, the recommended field strength should be at least 1.5 Tesla. It is required that facilities performing breast MRI must have equipment to perform mammographic and ultrasound correlation and MRI-guided intervention, or to have a referral agreement with a cooperating facility to do so.
This makes sense so that we can continue to take care of our patients after abnormal findings may be discovered on their breast MR. In terms of what position a patient is imaged in, they are imaged in the prone position. This is a picture of our breast imaging coil at the University of Washington. Our patient's heads are placed here in the holder and their arms are typically extended forward over their heads with their breasts pendulating through the aperture of the breast coil as indicated by the arrows. This allows the breast tissue to be optimally imaged and findings to be accurately localized by stretching out the normal fibroglandular tissue elements away from the chest wall. This approach also has the advantage of increasing the distance of breast tissue from the heart and lungs, which helps to minimize cardiac and respiratory motion artifacts. For ACR breast MRI accreditation, we need at least four key sequences. This includes a T2-weighted or bright fluid series, a pre-contrast T1-weighted series, and two post-contrast series. We have also found that T1-weighted non-fat suppressed type sequences are helpful to evaluate for fat within lesions. In terms of encoding gradients, we need to remember that most artifacts occur in the phase encoding gradient. So for a breast MRI with an axial acquisition, it is optimal for the phase encoding gradient to be in the transverse or ML medial lateral direction, while the frequency encoding gradient is in the AP or anterior posterior direction. In general, this would be the heart causing a pulsation artifact or in the phase encoding gradient, so I remember P for pulsation artifact in the P phase encoding gradient. In this example of a liver lesion, which is indicated by the yellow circle, you can see how the artifact is going in the transverse or ML direction because this is the direction of the phase encoding gradient. If this were to be switched and the phase encoding gradient goes in the AP dimension, like this, we could potentially misinterpret it an artifact as a breast mass. Next, let's talk about the practical approach to breast MRI interpretation. As with any radiology exam, the first step is to make sure we understand the major clinical question. Why are we doing this examination? If this is a screening exam, we want to understand what risk factors make this patient high risk. If this is an extensive disease exam, we want to know up front what the known location, size, and type of malignancy is, the patient's lymph node status, whether or not there's, there's been prior other biopsies in their associated pathology, and plans regarding breast surgery if known. For the systematic evaluation of images, I will show you a method of reviewing the sequences with the layout we use at the University of Washington. However, there are a number of different algorithms you can use to interpret breast MR, and you just need to make sure that you're systematic and consistent when you develop one that works the best for you. In general, we have our pre and post contrast images adjacent to each other on the top left-hand side of the screen, the T1 non-fat saturated images on the bottom left-hand side, subtraction images next to that, and on the right-hand side of the screen, we have the maximum intensity projections, or MIPS, the sagittal and coronal images on top of each other on the far right-hand side, and our fluid-sensitive sequences here. Again, everyone has their own algorithm to interpret breast MRI. I'm going to go through how I interpret these images and what I am particularly looking for on each sequence. First, on the T1 non-fat saturated images, I look for susceptibility artifacts such as surgical eclipse or biopsy marker clips. In this patient, she's had a prior lumpectomy, so I know where the lumpectomy site was because here is a susceptibility artifact from her surgical eclipse. I also evaluate for fat in inside lesions such as those for fat necrosis, lymph nodes, and in this case, this is an incidental intramuscular lipoma. On the T1 non-fat saturated images, I also look at the amount of fibroglandular tissue seen on MRI. This is similar to what we do with breast density on mammography, 
and there are four categories here which are almost entirely fat, scattered fibroglandular tissue, heterogeneous fibroglandular tissue, and extreme fibroglandular tissue. Then I quickly look at the T1 pre-contrast fat saturated images to look for things that are intrinsically T1 hyperintense, such as in this case, this person either has proteinaceous fluid or blood in some dilated ducts. We also see a lot of patients post biopsy for extensive disease workup, and here is a post biopsy hematoma. The reason why I do this is to evaluate for things that are intrinsically T1 hyperintense. So if I see this on the source post contrast image, I don't think that it is an enhancing lesion. I then spend most of my time on the post-contrast source images where I determine the amount of background parenchymal enhancement or BPE. I find unique lesions that stand out and I correlate these with the sagittal and coronal images. I also look for associated findings, evaluate lymph node chains, as well as extra mammary findings on these sequences. So first, what is background parenchymal enhancement or BPE? BPE is the normal enhancement of fibroglandular tissue. It is physiologic and it fluctuates with the menstrual cycle. This can be assessed on the first post-contrast images as shown here, or on the subtraction images or maximum intensity projections. The purpose of reporting BPE is to help indicate the possibility that an enhancing lesion may be hidden by normal background enhancement. And some studies have shown that there is an association with the increased risk of developing breast cancer in women who have more background parenchymal enhancement. And BPE is divided into four categories as shown down here. I remember the four M's for minimal, mild, moderate, and marked. BPE can also be described as symmetric or asymmetric by comparing the left and right breasts. And this is an example of a high-risk screening breast MRI in a 31-year-old woman. The patient had minimal background parenchymal enhancement in the prior year. And on this current year, she has marked background parenchymal enhancement. This is likely secondary to changes in hormonal influence due to varying stages of the menstrual cycle. And although studies have shown that marked BPE does not decrease sensitivity in the detection of breast malignancy, some institutions recommend that patients have their MRIs within the first half of their menstrual cycle. After this, I then proceed to looking at the subtraction and then the maximum intensity projection images. The subtraction images are created from subtracting the pre-contrast from the post-contrast images and can be used to confirm the presence or absence of enhancing lesions and to assess for additional lesions that I may not have seen on initial review of the source post-contrast T1 images. One aspect to be careful about when evaluating subtraction and MIP images is pseudo-enhancement due to motion artifact. This is images from the same patient. This is her MIP and these are the subtraction images. And on first glance, it looks like this patient might have marked background parenchymal enhancement. In addition, it might look like she has focal non-mass enhancement in the lateral breast as indicated by the ellipse here. However, this is actually pseudo-enhancement. When I show you the pre-contrast and post-contrast series, as indicated on the bottom of the screen, the patient really has minimal background enhancement. And what causes the pseudo enhancement here is because we are subtracting fat tissue from fibroglandular tissue here, because the patient had moved in between the pre and the post contrast images. This is due to interscan motion. Here are our maximum intensity projection images. And this can also better help us better understand the relationship of multiple lesions, like in this case where we see multiple masses in the central breast here, 
This was the patient's known breast cancer. However, there's also a small mass in the anterior breast. This was subsequently biopsied and also shown to be another area of invasive cancer. I have found that in presenting for tumor boards, our surgeons really like looking at the maximum intensity projection images because this can help them better understand the orientation of multiple lesions within the breast as well as their relationship to each other. Finally, if I have not already reviewed these images when trying to characterize a distinct lesion, I will look at the T2 weighted or fluid sensitive sequences to evaluate for anything else that I might have missed. So in this case, in general, we see a lot of cysts in breasts. So these are examples of cysts on both of these patients. In, ad in addition, I find that I always see most liver lesions on the T2 weighted sequences, and these most commonly represent cysts or hemangiomas, although generally they're harder to tell. Finally, I will look at the coronal and sedral sequences. I will evaluate internal mammary lymph node chains. I will look at the axillary lymph nodes one more time. And I tend to look at the sternum and bones on these sequences. Unfortunately, in this case, this is a woman with multiple metastases to her sternum, which are clearly seen here on the coronal images. We have now reviewed the majority of sequences that we see on breast MRI, and we'll be going over the kinetic evaluation of unique findings and special sequences in the next part of this lecture. That concludes the first part. Welcome to part two of a basic brief overview of breast MRI. We have already reviewed breast MRI indications, technique, and an algorithm for interpretation. We will next explore the three types of findings described on breast MRI, then go through a few case examples of common findings. First, in looking at findings, we need to identify if this is real and unique. In order to do this, we take advantage of all of the other sequences, such as the sagittal coronal sequences, T2, T1 non-fat saturated, and sometimes kinetic evaluation. Prior imaging can also prove to be extremely helpful to see if there are stable correlates to, in other modalities if this was the baseline MRI, such as on prior mammograms or ultrasound. There are three main types of MRI findings. These are focus, mass, and non-mass enhancement. We'll first talk about a focus, which is a unique dot of enhancement, which is typically less than five millimeters in size. This is too small to characterize as a mass or non-mass enhancement. And if it is uniform and T2 hyperintense, this is generally a benign finding. If it's not unique and there are other similar appearing foci throughout the breasts and on the contralateral breasts, this likely represents background parenchymal enhancement. The next finding is a mass, which is a three-dimensional space-occupying lesion and it's described by its shape, margins, and internal enhancement characteristics. First, we're going to talk about shape. And similar to on mammography and ultrasound, the shapes are described as round, oval, and irregular. So R, O, and I. A round mass is spherical. An oval mass can contain up to three gentle ovulations. And a regular mass like this one is uneven and cannot be characterized by one of the other shapes. So remember, ROI, round, oval, irregular. Next, we can talk about margins. And margins are also important predictors of the likelihood of malignancy, in addition to shape. And margins are either described as circumscribed or not circumscribed, as shown here. So here's circumscribed, which is nice, and you can draw a nice line around it, irregular, and spiculated. In addition, there are a few descriptors for internal enhancement characteristics for a mass, and these include homogeneous, heterogeneous, and rim enhancement. Homogeneous is uniform and confluent, as shown here, 
Heterogeneous has variable internal enhancement and it's non-uniform. Rim enhancement, as shown here, has these peripheral rims around it, like this. There's also a special case of dark internal semptations, which is suggestive of fibroadenoma. So here on this post-contrast sequence, we can see an oval circumscribed mass, and there's this dark internal semptation or line denoted by the purple dashed line. As an isolated feature, the negative predictive value of dark internal septations is insufficient to exclude malignancy. However, if this is also a T2 bright mass with benign enhancement characteristics, this is likely a fibroadenoma. Finally, non-mass enhancement is a third type of finding. This is a unique area of enhancement that is not a focus or a mass, and it's discrete from normal background parenchymal enhancement. Non-mass enhancement is described by distribution and internal enhancement patterns. So in this case, we've got on the top left-hand corner here, an example of linear, straight or curved, which may branch type of distribution. On the top right, this is focal non-mass enhancement, which is a small confined area, generally less than 25% of a quadrant. Over here, this triangular shaped area of enhancement is segmental distribution of non-mass enhancement. So this is a triangular cone with the apex generally pointing towards the nipple. And finally, this is a large area of enhancement that is described as a distribution of regional. So it doesn't conform to a ductal distribution, it's general geographic, and will um, be more than two quadrants. Second, the internal enhancement characteristics of non-mass enhancement include homogeneous, which is uniform and confluent, heterogeneous, which is non-uniform and may be separated by areas of parenchyma or fat. This is clumped non-mass enhancement, which looks like a cobblestone or a grape-like pattern, and this implies suspicious findings. And finally, here are clustered ring type enhancement, which is thin rims, which generally is the ducts that are enhancing here. And this also implies a suspicious finding. Next, we're going to talk about time intensity curves or kinetics, as masses and non-mass enhancement can further be described with kinetic characteristics. This representative image shows the different initial and delayed phase kinetic enhancement curves during dynamic contrast enhanced MRI. In the initial phase of enhancement, you can classify it as slow, medium, or fast enhancement, which is defined by the percent increase in signal intensity being less than 50, between 50 and 100, and greater than 100%, respectively, between slow, medium, and fast. This is from baseline within a region of interest, such as within a mass or non-mass enhancement. In the delayed phase, there are three main curve types. There is persistent or type 1, plateau or type 2, and washout or type 3. Persistent delayed enhancement is defined as continuous increase in enhancement greater than 10% of initial enhancement, and this is considered to be the most benign delayed enhancement curve type. Type 3, or washout, indicates decreasing signal intensity after peak enhancement that is greater than 10% of initial enhancement. And this is considered to be the most suggestive of malignancy. The plata plateau type, or type 2, refers to a relatively constant signal intensity once peak is reached and is of intermediate suspicion. And although the most classic curve type for malignancy is rapid initial enhancement followed by early washout. There is significant overlap of the kinetic curve types among benign and malignant lesions. And so as a result, these kinetic enhancement features should be interpreted in the context of other important clinical and imaging features, such as history, lesion morphology, and other comparison studies. And I find kinetic evaluation to be the most helpful in confirming that a lesion is benign when that lesion might demonstrate mostly benign morphological features. Um, and lesions with suspicious morphological features should be biopsied regardless of enhancement characteristics. 
So let's go through some examples. In this example, we see type three rapid washout kinetics. So here's an irregular mass right here. There's another mass right next to it in the right breast. You can see that the majority of the kinetic type is rapid and washout. And this turned out to be an invasive ductal carcinoma. In contrast, this is an oval mass with circumscribed margins. We notice that there's rapid initial enhancement, however, it's homogeneously persistent. This turned out to be a fibroadenoma. Now let's look at this third case. I'm gonna let you think about it for a little bit. This mass looks like it's almost C-shaped or reniform. There might be fat within it. However, it has rapid initial enhancement and washout. So if we were to purely look at kinetic features, we would think that this is malignant. However, if you look closer, you can notice that there's a vessel going towards it. And as you all can probably know, probably can tell, this is a normal lymph node. So do not biopsy this. Lymph nodes, because of what they do, are known to have rapid initial enhancement with washout. Next, we're going to talk about some associated features that we can describe, and it's important to note on breast MRI. These are nipple retraction, invasion, skin retraction, or thickening, as well as describing axillary adenopathy and pectoralis and or chest wall invasion. This is an axial and sagittal image of a 71-year-old woman with a history of IDC. As you can see here, there's evidence of nipple retraction due to her cancer on the axial and sagittal image. In addition to describing the nipple retraction, it's also important to note that this mass approximates the pectoralis musculature. However, there's still a clear fat plane in between the mass and the pectoralis muscle. You'll also notice that the pectoralis muscle is not enhancing. The axillary lymph nodes are divided into three levels that are defined by their relationships to the pectoralis minor muscle. Level 1 nodes are inferior and lateral to the pectoralis minor muscle. Level 2 nodes are either superficial or deep to this muscle. And level 3 nodes are superior and medial to the pectoralis minor. The majority of breast cancers spread into these axillary nodes with a small percentage of medially located tumors spreading into the internal mammary lymph nodes. This nodal chain is located parasternally deep to the intercostal muscles adjacent to the internal mammary vessels. Here is part of an axial image from a breast MRI which clearly depicts the pectoralis major and pectoralis minor muscles. Here is where level one lymph nodes are located on this study. This is lateral to the pectoralis minor. Level two lymph nodes are located either posterior or more superficial, with the more superficial ones given a different name. And level three lymph nodes are located medial to the pectoralis minor. Intrapectoral or Rotter's nodes are located in between the pectoralis major and minor muscles. A more detailed evaluation of breast reconstruction is described in a separate video. But it is important to understand that breast MRI is the best modality to evaluate for silicone implant complication, where both intracapsular and extracapsular rupture can be evaluated. This is an example of a silicone sequence where silicone is bright, and you can see that these lines right here are the silicone capsule itself, and there is high signal intensity on both the inside and the outside of these lines, indicating intracapsular rupture on the right. On the left, there is also intracapsular rupture, which is more severe because the implant itself has collapsed. In this image, there are secondary signs of extracapsular rupture where both the axillary lymph nodes and internal mammary lymph nodes are enlarged due to silicone inside these nodes. Finally, 
Given that there is a larger field of view than just the breast, as with other imaging modalities, it's also important to look at other findings, such as those in the chest or mediastinum and in the upper abdomen, particularly in the liver. On this fluid-sensitive sequence on this breast MRI, we saw that there is left lingular consolidation in addition to a little bit in the right middle lobe. On a subsequent chest CT, there was bilateral per peripheral, predominantly ground glass opacities with septal thickening, with consolidation primarily in the lingula and right little lobe. This was found to be due to pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. In addition, in the upper abdomen, in a different patient, we saw that there's all these T2 bright masses within the liver. Most commonly, we will see incidental cysts. However, in this patient with a known breast cancer, we recommended a CT, and the CT showed that this was due to multiple hepatic metastases from her known breast cancer. Now, we're going to go over some common cases that we see in breast MRI. This first case, I'm showing you some pre-contrast T1, post-contrast T1, and subtraction images. This was a 61-year-old woman with history of less breast pain and mastitis. And in these images, you can see at least two rim-enhancing masses at the 3 o'clock position with the more lateral mass displaying an oval shape with circumscribed margins. The more medial one was slightly more irregular. Differential. Things that you should be thinking about for rim enhancing masses include inflamed cysts, abscesses, fat necrosis. However, it could also be seen in malignant tumors like invasive ductal carcinoma, like mucinous types of cancers intracystic papilloma or papillary carcinoma. And to differentiate the two, based on their enhancement characteristics, this one has nice thin rim uniform enhancement, or as more suspicious enhancement characteristics would be thicker and more nodular type of rim enhancement. I'm next going to show you the T1 and T2 sequences, which can help us distinguish what this might be. The more medial mass exhibits increased T2 signal intensity on the T2 weighted image, whereas the more lateral mass has more heterogeneous signal intensity on the T2 weighted image. In addition, you can see that there is edema throughout this breast. With the history of mastitis, when we went back in the history, it looked like the more medial mass was a cyst that was recently aspirated, and the more lateral mass was actually a cyst that had hemorrhaged within itself. So this actually ended up being inflamed cyst. It was benign. This next case was a 48-year-old woman with also history of cysts in both breasts. This was a high-risk breast cancer screening MRI. I am showing you the T1 non-contrast or pre-contrast, the T2, as well as pre- and post-contrast sequences. Here you see an oval mass with circumscribed margins and internal fluid fluid levels. Notice how there's no evidence of enhancement between the pre- and post-contrast image. And also, Remember that on these breast MRIs, the patients are laying prone on the MRI scanner, and the images are oriented so that the anterior is at the superior aspect of the image, and the patient's back or posterior is at the inferior aspect of the image. The high signal intensity on the T1 and low signal intensity on the T2 demonstrates the hemorrhagic or proteinaceous component, while the low signal intensity on T1 and high signal intensity on the T2 indicate simple fluid component. A targeted ultrasound with the patient laying supine shows an oval mass with circumscribed margins and a fluid fluid level. This is 
consistent with the proteinaceous component or the hemorrhagic component laying dependently. So this was a proteinaceous cyst. What about this next case? We have a post-contrast image, subtraction in T2. We see a three-dimensional structure here. Well, this is two-dimensional, but believe me, this was a mass. But look at the internal enhancement characteristics. So you see these dark internal septations on the post-contrast image. This is true because on the subtraction, we still see it here. This is an oval mass with circumscribed margins and is T2 bright. T2 bright, oval mass, circumscribed margins, dark internal septations. If I tell you that the enhancement characteristics were fairly benign, meaning let's say it was rapid with persistent kinetics, this is a fibroadenoma. Next, let's look at our last case. This is a subtraction image from a bilateral breast MRI. You notice again, these are rim-enhancing masses bilaterally. These are thin rim enhancement. Showing you the T2-weighted images here. Is anything T2 bright in the middle of these masses? No. So these are not cysts. And because of the thin, uniform peripheral rim enhancement, you're thinking more benign characteristics. Next, let's look at the T1 non-fat saturated image, and you'll notice that all of the internal characteristics follow fat. So, and also notice that it looks like this patient's had surgery. So this is a patient that has had bilateral mastectomies with deep reconstructions, and this was consistent with fat necrosis. Okay. So we've gone through a whirlwind of the basics of breast MRI. Um, that concludes our brief overview, and thank you for your attention.